We have a choice, what we're going to choose, how we're going to believe, how we're going to react. And how many know life gets tough sometimes? Yes, it gets tough sometimes. And we wonder why, and we have questions, and we have doubts. And God's okay with that, isn't he? Someone told me one time, you should never ask God why. And I said, I don't believe that. I believe God's shoulders are big enough to handle my why questions. And I believe I serve a God is big enough to handle my why questions. So, sure, we all ask the question why sometimes, and why did this happen, and why is this going on? And God is able to take care of that and help us through that. And we're honored to have you here this morning with us in our service. If you have a bulletin, hopefully you got one when you came in. Inside of that is a place for some sermon notes. And we'd ask you to write notes down and take notes this morning. If you don't write it down, you will not remember what I say today. You'll remember a few things. You might remember a wheelbarrow full of toilet paper and paper towels. But we want you to remember more than that for being in this service today. Amen? With a whole lot of other things we want you to remember this morning about being here. So you write it down, you can review it, you can retain it. If you can retain information, then you can apply information. And that's why we have you write things down so you can apply what you hear, what you learn about this morning. Today we're going to talk about dare to be different. You see on the screen there, one of those matchsticks is just a little bit different than the rest of them. And we're talking about daring to be different this morning. The first part of Romans chapter 12 reads this way from the English Standard Version of the Bible. It says, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. It is simple, it's clear, it's concise. But what exactly does Paul mean when he says, do not be conformed to this world? Now I want to read some other translations of that passage from Romans 12 and 2. They're not going to be on the screen, so I just want you to listen to these other translations. The New Life Translation says, do not act like sinful people of the world. The New Century Version says, do not change yourselves to be like the people of this world. The Amplified Bible says it this way, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. I like that one. And finally, the New Living Translation says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. And Eugene Peterson paraphrases it in the message by this way. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. So the general meaning is relatively clear. If we take all of these translations and paraphrases and lump them all together, we could have a statement that looks something like this. We are not like the people around us, and we should not act like them. We must not try so hard to fit into the culture that we no longer think and act like Christians. I'll read that again. That's just condensing all these into one. We are not like the people around us, and we should not Act like them. We must not try so hard to fit into the culture that we no longer think and act like Christians. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, you would probably agree with the statement I'm about to make. But I believe that our society and our world in general is working against believers in Jesus Christ. Society's working against us. The world is working against us. So the warning is, as a Christian, we are constantly swimming upstream, and the world is constantly rushing at us. And it is a battle to not conform. It is a battle to not fit in. It is a battle to not get squeezed into that mold. So it should not surprise us when we're swimming upstream and the world is coming downstream, that shouldn't surprise us. What we cannot do is we cannot be swept away by that. And so the danger that we face when we read Paul's writings in Romans 12 and 2 is that we come up with a wrong meaning or a wrong idea of what Paul is telling us. So I think there are two wrong meanings that we interpret out of this passage of Scripture that I want to deal with first this morning. The first wrong meaning is that Paul is warning only against external marks or external things of the world. 
Now, in another generation, now maybe not the younger generation, but in another generation, preachers applied this passage, Romans 12 and 2, to the four big sins. How many know there's some big sins? All right? We got big sins and little sins and mediocre sins, and sometimes you're not even sure if they're sins or not. But they would take this passage and apply it to the four big sins. Drinking, smoking, dancing, and playing cards. That was the four big sins in a generation past. You smoked, you drank, you danced, you played cards. Or they could apply this verse to women wearing lipstick in a generation past. Or it could have been with men who had long hair. Or it could have been women who wore short skirts. Or it could have been listening to a certain kind of music in a generation past. Or it could have even been going to a movie theater in generations past. Some of you maybe don't have a church background and don't have a church history. You didn't grow up in a generation like that. And that's all new to you, perhaps, to hear that. But in generations past, that's how this verse was applied. It was applied on what you did externally and the things you did in your life. And sometimes the list of don'ts became so long that we were defined as Christians by what we did not do. I do not wear lipstick, therefore I'm a Christian. And and just for the record, I don't wear lipstick, but I just want to throw that out there. I need y'all to wake up with me this morning. I do not go to the movie, so therefore I'm a Christian. I do not wear pants if you're a woman, therefore I'm a Christian. I do not have long hair as a man, therefore I'm a Christian. And the list got longer and longer and longer and longer, and everything I didn't do made me a Christian. And for many of us who were raised in that type of church culture, we now talk about some of those things, and we laugh about them. We laugh about how women didn't wear lipstick or men couldn't have long hair or, you know, we couldn't wear pants to church if you're a woman and we couldn't go to the movie. We kind of laugh at those things. Now, we never laugh at the people and the sincerity of them, but now some of those things are almost laughable the way we were, because we were taught it is simply external. Paul is warning us about external things. And so if the world does this and you can't do that, You know, you don't go swimming in a public swimming pool where there's men and women swimming together because that's just bad. And you don't wear shorts to the beach. When you go to the beach, you wear jeans and a T-shirt. I was was talking to some old church folks. I know some of you know what I'm talking about. And some of you jumped in the ocean like I did in a pair of jeans and a T-shirt and thought you were going to drown and lose your life because you know how heavy a pair of blue jeans gets when they're wet? That's what we were taught, though. We were taught those things. Some of you were taught some of those things as well. My kids were younger. Tyler and Ashley, my kids and Robin's kids, we have kids together, as you heard earlier. <laughs> I don't have another wife, Diana. <sighs> I'll leave that alone. But when our kids were younger, they couldn't believe some of the things we couldn't do as kids and as teenagers and even as a young married couple. They just couldn't believe the things we couldn't do. Because we were taught, don't conform to the world. Conformity meant do everything opposite the way that the world did it. But you know what most of us have learned, and we have evolved through the years, is that Christianity cannot be reduced to a set of rules. Christianity is not a set of do's and don'ts. That is not what Christianity is about. And while that's true, the warning for many of our early church fathers had some basis in fact. And I'm not so sure that dropping the rules that we used to follow has produced a new wave of holiness in the 21st century. I'm afraid there are some times that we throw out the baby with the bathwater. And even though we realize that do's and don'ts are not what it's all about, we have thrown away some things that weren't necessarily bad or wrong within themselves. And there has not produced a new wave of holiness within the body of Christ. And so from time to time, we do need to check ourselves and make sure that we are not conforming to the world around us and being pressed into its mold. So that's that's the first thing that we get wrong sometimes. Second thing that we think Paul said, but he didn't really say, is that Paul is telling Christians to withdraw from the world and have nothing to do with it. And Paul is not telling us that. 
do not be conformed to the world. He's not saying withdraw from the world and not have anything to do with it at all. You know, some people think that we should join a monastery, we should go to some isolated place in the woods or into a cave, or we should move to the desert somewhere, and that way we will never be tempted. If I just get out of the bright lights of the city and I hide somewhere, I'll never be tempted to do anything wrong again. Now, we know that's not what Paul meant. In fact, Paul went to the big cities of his day. He ministered in the big cities of his day. So whatever not being conformed to this world means, it cannot be a call for us to run and to hide from everything. It can't be what it means. So if this verse is not giving rules about outward behavior, and if it's not calling us to retreat from the world, what exactly is Paul warning us against? Well, there's two words we're going to focus on this morning as we un fold this text. The first word is world. World. Now the word world does not refer to this planet. It's not like Paul is saying, I don't want you to enjoy the creation that God has made. He is not talking about physical things such as the beauty of a sunset or the mountains in the fall or the vastness of the universe. Paul's not talking about that. He's not talking about enjoying a concert or a conversation with a friend. He's not talking about playing peekaboo with a baby or riding your motorcycle or graduating college or whatever it is that brings you pleasure. Paul is not saying don't enjoy life. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I bet you know some people who are Christians and it looks like they don't enjoy life at all. I mean, they're the saddest Droopiest face, that's not even a word. People you know. There is no joy in them. There is no happiness in them. They don't love life. They don't love anything about life. And it looks like they are miserable serving God. But Paul is not saying be miserable serving God and be miserable living this life. He is not telling us to reject the beauty of things around us. He's not telling us not to see the goodness in everything around us. He is not calling us to move away from the troubles of this world and to hole up in some compound and build a fence and buy a shotgun and dare anybody to come on my property. Now, if that's you this morning, that's fine. But that's not what the Bible's telling us to do. Not at all. In fact, if you read the New Testament, you'll find out that Paul plunged right into the heart of the culture of his day. He focused on all the major cities of the first century. Listen, he went to Jerusalem, and he went to Antioch, and he went to Corinth, and he was in Athens, and he was in Rome. He was in every major city of his day, and he focused on the culture there. Paul fearlessly walked into the synagogues in these cities, and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He went into the marketplace where the shopkeepers were, and people were buying and selling and trading, and he preached the gospel there. He went to the lecture halls, and he shared the gospel. And he did all of this with the purpose of proclaiming Christ where he was not known. And later on, Paul would say this, everything created by God is good. Everything. And then he would say, that God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Think about the Apostle Paul. He knew Hebrew, he knew Greek, he knew Latin, he knew Aramaic. He could speak all of those languages. He read the secular poets of his day. He even quoted in the New Testament letters the poets of his day. He put their quotes into his letters. He knew the culture of his day so well that he could debate the pagan philosophers on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. Paul was immersed in his culture and in the world in the time of his life. He didn't run away from it. He didn't hide from it. He didn't have any, nothing to do with it at all. He was immersed in the culture of his day. Well, that doesn't mean he was immersed in the sinfulness of his day, but he was immersed in the culture of his day. Listen, folks, we've got to know what's going on in the world around us. We've got to watch some news, and we've got to read, 
And we've got to listen to some things. We have to know what is going on around us. We have to know the culture. How can we effectively minister in a culture if we don't know what the culture is? How can we effectively help people within our society if we don't know what's going on within our society ourselves? We have to know what is going on. So if Paul is not meaning that we get involved in the culture when he uses that word world, what does he mean? And what is he warning us against? Well, in the New Testament, there are two words used for world. The first is cosmos. And that's the cosmos, maybe we can think of the outer space. It's also where we get the word cosmetic from. And it refers to an organized system of life that leaves God out completely. It's the cosmos. It leaves God out. God's not involved in this, has nothing to do with it. And the second word used for world in the New Testament is the word that Paul uses in our scripture. It is the word ion, and it is translated age. Now, in the New Testament, there are two main ages. There is this present age of sinful darkness the Bible talks about, and as believers in Jesus Christ, we have been rescued from this sinful darkness, this present age. And then there is the age which is to come, and that's when the Lord comes back to reign on this earth. So there's two ages that we talk about in the Bible. And so the text would literally read and be translated this way, do not be conformed to this age. Do not be conformed to this present age age of sinful darkness. And why is that? Because this age is going to end soon. And we believe that as Christians. This age of darkness is going to end soon. And when it does, everything involved in this age is going to crumble and turn to dust. So here's the challenge of Romans 12 and 2. We live in this present age, but this present age will not last forever. We know as believers that there is a better age to come when Christ will reign on this earth. So we must live today, watch this, we live today by the values of tomorrow. This age will not last forever. There is a better age coming. So we live this age today by the values of tomorrow. We must live in this present age. We must live in this sinful darkness, this world around us. But this present age must not live inside of us. We live in this age, but the age doesn't live inside of us. I think the Bible says something like this. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We live in this age, but the age is not inside of us. So here's that, the challenge. First is the world. And then Paul, the second word we have to look at is the word conform. Now, the word conform translates from a Greek word, which we get our English word scheme. It's a scheme. And what is a scheme? Well, scheme is a trap. It's kind of like if you ever get those emails from the person in Nigeria who says you have won $10,000, all you have to do is send us your bank account number, and your social security number, and we'll put it in your bank tomorrow. That's all you have to do, right? That is an email scheme. And that's what Paul is saying. If you conform to this world, if you conform to this scheme, then you're going to get yourself in trouble. See, it should not surprise us that Satan sets traps for us on every hand. And most of his traps are very subtle, and they have a way of squeezing us into the mold of this world. And before we realize it, we are sucked into the way of thinking that is in this world. I don't want to get on this subject much. I just want to say this. A few months ago, the Supreme Court of the United States said that gay marriage is now legal in this country. It's a law. But do you realize it didn't just happen a few months ago? The very first lawsuit was filed by a couple in Hawaii, a gay couple in Hawaii, over 20 years ago. They filed the first lawsuit to get married in Hawaii. 
It has taken more than 20 years for that first lawsuit to filter down, filter down, filter down, filter down. And now, finally, gay marriage is the law of this land in which we live in. Didn't happen overnight. But you know what happened? It slowly squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And you know what's happened, whether you want to admit it or not. Even us as Christians, that mold has squeezed us. And where we once were repulsed by homosexuality and repulsed by gay marriage and repulsed by that thought, we now see it almost daily on our television shows. We bring it into our homes. It's in the movies that we watch. It's in the people that we know. And we have now become adjusted to that. Not saying we accept it, not saying that we like it, still saying that we don't think it's right in the eyes of God, but we have become adjusted to that lifestyle because it is slowly and slowly and slowly squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And that is what conformity is. It slowly squeezes you into a mold until you accept it. And we're there, aren't we? We're there. And we talk about things that used to be sin, things that used to be wrong, things how they used to be, but we have slowly been squeezed into that mold and into that way of thinking. Now, that word conform also translates to fashion. Has nothing to do with clothing, but it means that we are not to think or act or fashion ourselves after the schemes of this age. Now, what's wrong with doing that? Why can't I think like this age, this world? Why can't I believe like they believe? Because this world is dying, and it is soon going to end. And the very essence of worldliness is to live as if this age will last forever. True worldliness means to buy into the notion that this world is the only world there will ever be. And it's the idea of living today as if tomorrow will never come. It'll never come. Now, I don't know what big purchases you make in your life and in your finances, but isn't it nice to go and buy whatever it is you're buying? And they say, you know what? You don't have to make the first payment for 90 days. No payment for 90 days. Buy that new car. No payment for 90 days. Buy that new TV that you want, no payment for 90 days, whatever it is you're buying. And that 90 days is great, isn't it? And you know what you should have been doing? You should have been saving that payment up for 90 days. And when the first payment came along, you should have socked it all on there. But what did you do? You went out to eat, and you bought this, and you bought that, and you wasted that, and you went on vacation, and did everything else. And 90 days later, you opened the mailbox. Pow. And there it is. It seems so good for 90 days. You know what that is? It's living as though tomorrow's never going to come. And so many people are living this life as though tomorrow is never going to come. You know, a few years ago, a beer company advertised with the slogan, and I don't normally quote beer commercials in church, but I'm going to quote one today. And here's what it said. You go around in life once, grab all the gusto you can. Grab all the gusto. You only go around in life once. And in one level, that's good advice, isn't it? This is not a dress rehearsal. You don't get a second chance or a redo if you mess up in your short time on planet Earth. This is it. This is the only chance you get on this Earth. But the unspoken message of that commercial was this. This is the only life that you're going to live. Do whatever you want to do, indulge in whatever you want to indulge in, and throw away every restraint that there is. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I can tell you something. Christians don't fit in, and we never will. I'm going to say this with all the love I can muster. If you're a Christian and you're fitting in with everybody around you, you need to check yourself. Christians do not fit in, and they never will. Doesn't mean people won't like you. Doesn't mean you can't be successful. 
Doesn't mean that you can't accomplish some great things in life, but you should never fit in with the world around you and its schemes around you. Someone once said, we are fools if we make conformity the goal of our lives. If you just want to conform, if you just want to fit in, then we are simply fools. And a few years ago, rocker Alice Cooper, who had become a Christian, I don't know if he still is or not, but he made this quote. He said, drinking beer is easy. Trashing your hotel room is easy. But being a Christian, that's a tough call. That's rebellion. It's tough being a Christian. It's tough being a believer in today's society, in today's culture. It's tough being a child of God. There was a day when you could tell someone you were a Christian and it meant something to them. There was a day when I could tell people I was a minister and it really meant something to them, Brother Michael. It carried some weight behind it. It carries some respect behind it. Not so much anymore. Not so much. See, the, the culture has just changed. It's just different than it used to be. And it's tough being a child of God now. And see, Alice Cooper had it right. It's easy to get drunk and to fool around. It's easier to do those things than it is to follow Jesus Christ. And so if you want to be a true rebel and you want to go against the status quo, then you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, make him the Lord of your life, and you'll be going against the flow every single day of your life. Hallelujah. Every day you'll fight against it. So if you think this world's going to last forever, then you live by the world's rules. But if you think there's a better place coming, then you live today in light of tomorrow. You know what that means for some of you? Your friends are not gonna understand this one bit when you tell them I'm living for Jesus now. Yes. They won't understand it. It won't always be easy. Your family won't always understand what you're doing and why you go to church and why do you give your time and why do you give of your money? They won't understand all those things. And you'll be squeezed and you'll be forced to try to conform to the world around you. But if you commit your life to Jesus Christ, you will not wake up with a hangover that comes from getting drunk on the ways of the world. You won't have to deal with that. You know what some people get drunk on? Some people get drunk on alcohol. That's obvious, sure. Some people get drunk on building an empire. Others get drunk on fame. Some get drunk on money. Others get drunk on power. Some get drunk on ambition. Others get drunk on revenge. And all of that's okay as long as this age lasts forever. In fact, it makes sense to live that way if tomorrow is never coming, doesn't it? I'll just get drunk on all these other things in life. Why not grab all the gusto? Why not indulge your passions and trample on other people if you really think you're going to live forever and this present age is never going to end? Remember what I said true worldliness is? It's living as if tomorrow is never going to come. Now, look at 1 John 2, 17. The writer said, the world is passing away along with all its desires. The best and the brightest of all of us in this room this morning are going to die one day. That is reality. Some point in time in the future, I'll die and you'll die. And there'll be a minister standing over top of us looking down at our casket and they'll be talking about us. But the reality is we're all going to die one day. In fact, God designed us that way. He made these bodies to wear out and give out. Because this present age is not all there is. There's another age that is to come where you're tired, broken, sick, worn out, achy, hurting body will become a new, healed, perfect, whole, complete, non-achy, non-hurting body. 
and I live today believing that that's going to happen in my future. He didn't make us to live here forever and to enjoy this world forever. And so the writer says that the world is passing away and along with it, all of its desires. And you know what's going to happen when you pass away? You will eventually be forgotten by most people. Now your spouse will still remember the kids The grandbabies, yeah, they'll remember mom and dad and grandpa and grandma. They'll talk about you when that anniversary rolls around when you passed. They might even go to the cemetery and put some flowers on the grave every now and then. But most people are going to forget about us. That's just the way life is. So with that in mind, I want you to think about these two sentences as you write them down. Those who look to this world for approval will eventually be disappointed because the best things of this world will one day disappear. If you're looking for this world to give you approval for your life, you're going to be disappointed because one day it's all going to disappear. It's going to be done. Well, here's the second thing I want you to write down. Those who look to God, to the God who created the world, will find safety and security that will last forever. You look to the God who created this world, you'll find safety and security that is going to last you forever and ever and ever. What a revelation the day of judgment is going to be for all of us. The things that we thought were so crucial, so vital, the things that we included on our personal resumes, the degrees we earned, the money we made, the deals we closed, the classes we taught, the buildings we built, the organizations that we managed, the budgets that we balanced, the books we wrote, the songs we sang, the trips we took, the the, the portfolios that we built, the fortunes that we amassed, the positions that we finally attain so that people in this world and even our Christian friends would be impressed by us. All the stuff that we take such pride in. The things that in and of themselves are not evil or wrong or bad, but are the stuff of life in this world. Every single bit of it, every part of it that gives us our reputation, our standing, our place in the world, even our place in the Christian world. All the stuff that we do that gives us our bragging rights proof that we were here and we made a name for ourselves in the 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 years that we live. Think of it. The Bible says all of it together means nothing. Zero. Zip. Nada. Vanity of vanities, Solomon said. You see, it's so easy for all of us to get sucked into the world's way of thinking and how quickly it happens on so many levels. All of it someday will amount to nothing. Pastor, shouldn't I go to school? Yes, you should go to school. Shouldn't I try to develop this business? Yes, develop that business. Shouldn't I try to build my resume? Absolutely, build your resume. But always keep in mind, one day, it's all gone. It's all over with. It doesn't make a difference in the end. All the stuff of this world that makes us who we are will one day be gone. And that is precisely at the point that the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes so powerful. Because when all that stuff is gone, he still remains. He is still constant. And I don't care how many initials you have after your name. I rejoice with you and I'm proud of you. But the greatest thing you could have after your name is Christian. And I don't care how many buildings you built. The greatest thing that can be said of you, that you were a Christian. And I don't care how many business deals you made and closed. The best thing could ever be said of you is that you were a Christian. And I don't care how much money you have into the bank. The greatest thing that could ever be said of you is that you are a Christian. Jesus came to save us, 
and he lives now to help us. And if we will ask him to fill us with this fullness of who he is, if we will ask him to show us the truth about who we are, if we will pray and ask him, he will help us break the addiction to the schemes of this dying age. This world is passing away. It's passing away. And I know this is not a fluffy, make you feel good kind of sermon. But you know, every now and then, even myself, I need a swift kick in the pants to wake us up to that reality. Because we got sucked into the world system and we got sucked into what the world wants us to be and we've gotten accustomed to this and we've gotten accustomed to that and we fell for that scheme and we fell for the other scheme and we fail to remember that this world is passing away and everything in it is passing away. Don't be swept away. Keep swimming upstream with Jesus. And dare to be different. Dare to be different. Before I pray, let me say this. When I say dare to be different, I don't mean be obnoxious. And don't put people down. And don't call people names. And don't be critical of people. But just be different. And if you will ask him to, God will give you opportunities to share your faith with people in a way that can speak to them, speak to their heart, speak to them right where they are. And so when you go to work tomorrow, if you work, when you walk into that building or whatever the job site is that you're going to go to, people can see something different about you. They won't tell you those jokes they tell everybody else. They won't show you those things on their phone they show everybody else. They won't invite you to go places that they go like they invite everybody else because they know you're just different. I'm not better. I'm just different. I'm not on a pedestal. I'm just different. You know what will happen eventually? They'll be attracted to your difference that's in their life. And they may begin to ask you to pray for them. They may want to talk to you. And they may begin to ask you about why you are different. Why don't you do this? And why don't you go there? Why don't you act like? Why? And then you can tell them the reason for the hope and the joy and the peace that is inside of you. This world is passing away, folks. Don't get caught up in it. Don't get swept away by it. Just be different than everybody else around you.